Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this Emerging Scholars Network conversation. Uh, my name is Bob Truby and I serve as the National Director for the Emerging Scholars Network. Yesterday morning, I finished reading through the First Nations version of the New Testament, an indigenous translation uh, uh, written for, particularly with the First Nations people of North America in mind. Today, we have the honor of talking with the lead translator of this new version of scripture, uh, one that has helped me read with fresh eyes, and I hope uh, for many of you as well. He's also a contributor to a Lenten devotional titled A Just Passion that we'll be uh, talking about as well, and you'll have an opportunity to purchase both books. Uh, we're going to be recording today's conversation. If you prefer not to be recorded or photographed, uh, uh, please keep your mic, mic muted and disable your video. By continuing to participate in our ESN conversation with your video and or audio enabled, after our recording begins, you consent to allow InterVarsity to use the recording and any screenshots of our conversation for InterVarsity ministry. In, including posting a video online for asynchronous viewing. I'm going to stop the recording for a moment and give you a chance to uh, adjust the settings on your, uh, 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 you know, on your computer if you'd like. Let me take this share off here. And... So I, uh, it's a privilege for me to introduce uh, uh, Terry Wildman. He is the lead translator, general editor, and project manager of the First Nations version of the New Testament. He serves as the director of spiritual growth and leadership development for Native InterVarsity. He's also the founder of Rain Ministries and has previously served as a pastor and worship leader. He and his wife, Darlene, live in Arizona. Terry, thank you so much. Welcome to our conversation. And uh, you'll want to unmute there. Okay, good. Um, Terry, well, thank you. Uh, please, thank you for joining us. I wanted to begin with, uh, I've given a brief introduction, but I wondered if you might uh, introduce yourself as you might in a First Nations context to give people a little more sense of what that's like. Sure, I'll share an Ojibwe greeting that was taught to me. Uh, I'll, I'll speak Ojibwe and then I will translate it for everyone. Buju Niji, Bimarzig, Gitcha Nimiki Menomash Kiki Manadu, Indigo, Terry Wildman Nishnakaz, Nimi Noaya Gaye Nimenwendam, Uma Ayayan Nungum. So what I said was um, in Ojibwe was, Hello, my friends who share this life together with me. My spirit name given to me by my Ojibwe mentors. Um, through a naming ceremony is Gichianimiki Menomash Kiki Manadu. It means voice of great thunder with a good medicine spirit. And I'm also known as Terry Wildman. Much easier to live up to. <clears throat> but I, I carry that name, uh, that my native name, uh, to honor my people and, and to, and I also grieve the loss of our language uh, and the, the fact that I, I and over 90% of us uh, do not speak our our traditional languages. Um, my uh, ancestry includes Ojibwe from Ontario, Canada, um, Yaqui from Sonora, Mexico. Um, my wife, uh, um, uh, Darlene, is a, a beautiful flute player. We live in Maricopa, Arizona, and we live on the traditional lands of the Pima and the Tohono O'odham, uh, two of the the local uh, tribal people here, uh, right around where we live here in Maricopa, Arizona. It feels really good, I said in my greeting, to be with you all here today. Thank you. Well, well thank you so much. We are honored to have you and, and, and grateful that you would take the time with us. I know you have a lot going on right now. Uh, I wondered if to start with, if you just might tell us a little bit about how the First Nations version came about. Why was it felt that this translation was needed? Well, the short version of, of the story 
is that my wife and I were living on the Hopi Indian Reservation in northern Arizona. I had served uh, two years there with a mission organization and then began pastoring an a, a, uh, American Baptist church on Second Mesa. And as the pastor there, I wanted to begin to incorporate as much of the culture as I could uh, within, within our, our services and everything. And um, <clears throat> we used uh, the NIV, almost all the churches out on the res uses, use the NIV Bible. And we jokingly called that the New Indian version just because we all used it. But uh, but um, <clears throat> I began to notice when I did, uh, I did a lot of jail ministry and different things. I began to notice that people weren't really connecting uh, to uh, the Bible passages, to conversations about Scripture. So um, <clears throat> I just began to uh, reword things. I, I worked with some of the men and women in the in the jail ministry in different places, and we began to reword the Scriptures in English since our people aren't speaking our languages, even less can read the language. So imagine that 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 on the Hopi res maybe. Uh, I I could only I only heard I never was able to verify this, but I heard there was one Hopi pastor that could read the uh, from the Hopi Bible, but I found that Bible in the storage room in our church fellowship hall, and that Bible um, <clears throat> uh, I was so excited I wanted to re I wanted someone every Sunday to read from the Hopi Bible and then translate it over for us. And I found out that uh, none of our, the people in our church could read it uh, or anything. And that's what stirred me up to begin to work at, with this idea that, well, if our Native people aren't reading all these Bibles that were translated into our languages, and, and over the years, I've learned that, that it was worse than I initially thought. Um, um, I'm guessing, uh, it, you know, one to two, maybe three percent uh, might be able to read the Bible in their original mother tongue. And you know how important that is to hear the scriptures uh, in, in a way that really relates to you deeply within. And that's what language does. Language is so powerful, more powerful than any of us realize this. You know, I mean, even in even the idea that in the beginning, God spoke you know, and speaking it uh, just uh, insinuates a language. And what does language do? Language paints pictures. Language gives us imagery to begin to relate to creator, to each other, to the world around us. When we name something, it gives us it gives us an you know. So when you share that name, or you say rabbit, oh, instantly. Everybody gets a picture of a rabbit. Now, we're not all seeing the same rabbit. You know, it depends on your culture. It depends on how, how you were raised. So then if I begin to identify different uh, cultural uh, or different kinds of rabbits and describe that rabbit with with adjectives and, and then uh, different things, then you begin to get an idea of what I'm seeing as I'm trying to convey these words out. And that's what the Bible does for us. But because the Bible was written in these ancient languages, Hebrew, thousands of years old, and 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 Greek of, of, of the new of the Second Temple period, the time that Jesus lived, G Greek back then was different than Greek today. The words aren't the same, and so, um, <clears throat> and even in the in the in the United States or North America, Turtle Island, we say, even here words. Uh, depending on where you ra raised, words can can mean something different, or it can hit you differently. It can affect you emotionally hearing certain words, because when you, as you grew up, those words impacted you. So as we, I sat with some of the men, and and we began to reword my favorite scriptures. You know, we did Psalm twenty three. We did. Uh, uh, some of the uh, verses out of Ephesians and things like this. And when I started working with the men and women and we started doing this, instantly they were engaged with the Bible oh. and the scriptures, where before trying to study it like a, a lesson just didn't, didn't 
connect, but but actually sitting down and saying, what would this, how would this best relate to us? How would we nowadays say it in English in a way that best reflects who we are as a native people? And so we just began that process of doing that. But at the time, I didn't dream this would become a translation. It was only just the beginning. It was seeds of an idea of just trying to work with, with, uh, with some of the Hopi and the Navajo people that were there to try to uh, engage in the scriptures. Uh, this is a beautiful story. And when that story is told in a good way, in a, in, a, in a way that since we're not speaking our language, can we still somehow use wording in English, make this colonial language serve us, you know, we'll, we'll take charge of that colonial language and we're going to make a, we're going to word it the way it means something to us, you know, and so we, we, of course, we went back and we used some of, uh, we read some of the elders from over a hundred years ago, Black Elk and Chief Joseph, Chief Seattle, and all these different people who had who were original language speakers and when they translated it over they made sure that it was said in english the way they wanted it said and and i, th I thought it was beautiful so we used phrase phrases from the elders the old ones the uh, the ancestors so to speak and so the idea of the first nation version was to you know, when we finally got to it, and I, I didn't tell you how we got to it, but uh, when we finally got to it, the idea was to have one of our elders, our native elders, telling the story to the younger generation. And that was our goal. It was to, to uh, you know, we, 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 we could have come up with some res slang version, but, but it, it didn't have the dignity. And we wanted this to have the dignity of our elders and, the, and our ancestors, the way they spoke with, with a powerful simplicity. I love it. Um, so uh, after years of doing this, working with us on the Hopi Res, we, my wife and I lived there five years. <clears throat> then we began to travel and we took our music and this, these translated or reworded portions of scripture on the road visiting reservations, visiting native communities, doing things at powwows. And I would just, she would play the flute and I would read uh, from the translation uh, in a storytelling manner. And, and uh, the native people that heard it, they would come up to me and they'd say, oh, you're saying it, you're saying it in English the way we think it in our language. And they'd say, oh, you need to keep doing this. We need a Bible like this. Some of them even came up and said, what Bible were you reading from? And I said, well, there isn't one. And But I kept thinking there's someone out there that's going to do this, right? I did research. I tried to find something. Nothing. And finally, uh, it was in, in, a, in about 2012, um, I made the commitment and said, uh, I felt, okay, God, uh, some people prayed over me, a large number of people prayed over me, and they said, Terry, you should pray about that you're the one to do this. God has put this on your heart. And I, you know, I didn't feel, uh, I wasn't trained to be a translator, formally trained in any way. Yeah, I learned some Greek and Hebrew basics. I, I, I know how to use Logos Bible software. I know how to get a, a hold of those commentaries and and so uh eventually i committed myself to the process and uh and began the the journey of translating but we we first did two books we did uh, uh the birth of the chosen one which is the christmas story in this in this but we had we weren't working with a bible translation yet we weren't uh we didn't have a a council yet. I just had a bunch of friends I would run my ideas by, native uh, friends who would give me feedback on on things. So we did that book, and we did another one, a Harmony of the Gospels, all four Gospels harmonized, which is impossible. We did it anyway, um, <clears throat> and so uh, and we were testing it out there, and we were getting such good feedback. And then I started the translation in 2015. And that's when, uh, when I, I did, I kind of thought, well, who's ever going to read this? Because who's going to take Terry Wildman seriously? Who's this guy? And how was he trained? 
what's what what college or what university did he, did he get his language training from and all this kind of stuff and i i couldn't I, i'd say well you know i just have this thing but that's when the bible translation organization one book in canada found my website found my facebook page and said we like what you're doing terry how would you like to partner together with us and we'll help you through this process. We'll fund you, we'll, uh, we'll get behind you. And so we, we met up and we, in June of 2015, we uh, partnered together and began this journey, which included putting together a translation council from all the different traveling. My wife and I traveled for 10 years. So we made relationships all over the country with native believers in Jesus and that's, that's who I reached out to to form our translation council. Hmm. So that's a, a little bit of that's the short version. Yeah, okay. well, you've you, you've actually told us some about how this project came together. What was the actual experience of, of you know you transitioning from having translated selected portions of the New Testament to doing working on the whole New Testament? What was it like for you to immerse yourself <clears throat> in that project? Uh, it, was, it was pretty much overwhelming. I can imagine. You know, it, 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 I just felt so big. It felt so, so just, just huge. And then it, then I felt the weight of it. The weight of it. I thought, wow, we're doing this translation that other people are going to read. That's going to get out there somehow. And I've got a Bible translation, uh, organization giving it credibility. I've got a council to help give it credibility and to add cultural depth, more cultural depth to it than I could. And by putting all these things together, it, it was a challenge. We had to figure out how we were going, going to do this translation. Here we are. We live all over the place. I mean, we, we got uh, council members in California and Washington State and in Arizona and uh, Ohio and New Mexico. I mean, we they, we were all spread out, and we we couldn't afford to fly and meet together very much. But one book did bring us together. Once we formed the council, they brought us together twice. Once in Orlando, Florida, with um, Wycliffe Associates, and they helped us for a whole week to look at the idea of a group translation, and then. For, for three weeks in, or two weeks in Calgary, Canada, we met together, our whole council, and that's where we began to identify not only uh, how we were going to do the translation, but, but um, the way we would work together. And one of the things we had to do while we were in Calgary was to identify over 185 key words and terms in the New Testament because Wycliffe said, you've got to get these 185. These are the most important words that in a translation into another culture or language. And we weren't translating into another language, but we were translating into another culture. And that was that that was its own challenge. And that's uh, uh, what makes this in some ways a unique translation. But we 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 identified words, uh, went through the whole entire list, 185, got that worked out. And then finally we decided, well, I, I learned about this amazing thing called Google Docs. And, and I thought, and, and how you can work on one document with everybody. You just give them permission and, and, and you can set up controls on it. You know, all people can only make suggestions. And so I would set all the reviewers up as suggestion makers and we would go through and 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 sometimes we we would hammer out some ideas uh, when suggestions didn't match. And, you know, when there was uh, wasn't full agreement, then we 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 would uh, sometimes get together. Uh, sometimes we'd call in Professor Hawk uh, from from Ashland Seminary. Sometimes we'd call on other native leaders and theologians to give us some ideas. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's how we did it. And we, and it was a process. It was a challenging process. It took us five years uh, to work through this here. And, and four of those years, I was pastoring a church in Northern Michigan, uh, an Anishinaabe church, uh, mostly Odawa or Ottawa. 
and uh and and doing the translation together so that was that was another challenge that happened so yeah it was uh i learned so much in the process and and it was i i'll never i mean it was so much work and i'm now we're doing psalms and proverbs and that's that's a different kind of approach and different challenges involved in that but but um i i i I now have a depth of appreciation for scripture and for our native culture that I I never had before. And so it's been so good for me spiritually uh, to to do this and to work on this project. And uh, I'm just amazed that God called me to do this and to oversee this and help push it forward. Mm. It, it, it does sound like God worked and God opened a way for you to do this. Uh, 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 that you kind of walked in the path that God was setting before you and he kept leading you into it. Yeah. Kind of like I thought, I always thought of a, like Abraham. Okay. I want you to go here, but I, but he didn't know where he was going. Hmm. He didn't know exactly how to, wh- 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 where God was taking him or where, where it would end up. But, but he just kept going in that direction. And as long as he kept going after what God told him to do, he was, he was doing okay. And even if he messed up, God straightened him out, you know. <laughs> I figured he must be able to do the same thing for me and for Amen. our team. Hey, I wanted to ask you if you could read a passage for us from the First Nations version that might give our audience some sense of the unique features of the translation. Sure. Um, you know, I thought uh, today uh, I, you know, uh, I'd pick out a couple of them that have. Uh, um, some ideas uh, that as, as we look into Lent, you know, um, uh, the ideas of of how does justice and 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 uh, how does it uh, d- does lament fit into this? And I think of Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. Here's the, the First Nation version it says, "Come close to my side, you whose hearts are on the ground, you who are pushed down." and worn out, and I will refresh you. Follow my teachings and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest from your troubled thoughts. Walk side by side with me, and I will share in your heavy load and make it light. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of, uh, you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with, with that scripture and the standard way it's translated. Um, Greek scholars tell me, oh yeah, that's what that that's a good translation. And that's what I loved about this, is we've had lots of Greek scholars, uh, seminary scholars and, and Bible translators actually say, wow, you you did a good job. Well, we had the help of, uh, one of the things I used a lot was the United Bible Society's Translator's Guide. And the United Bible Society creates these guides for translators to translate into other cultures and other languages, and it was it's it was just perfect as a as a as a guide because the Hebrew and Greek scholars were the ones that put these guides together for the translators to help them in that process. Let me share. I, I think I have another scripture I can share um, here. I love this one, Romans 12, 19. He says, my much loved family members, do not take the punishment of others into your own hands. Instead, turn all anger and wrath over to the great spirit. For the sacred teachings tell us, punishment punishment for wrongs belongs to me, says the great spirit chief. I will make sure the wrongs are made right again. And again, there's this idea of justice in there, but also the idea that that we're not to take matters in our own hands and violently react to injustice. We are supposed to react to injustice, but with with uh, compassion, with love, with words, but not with uh, with violence. And my, as I read the scriptures. Um, Another one that I would like to read, I love this one, um, Ephesians uh, 4, 22 through 24. 
And what we pull in here uh, is this, is the word, Native people, the outfits we wear at, at our, our gatherings and our powwows and things like that, we call that regalia, which is kind of a, a regal wear, you know. Um, so Ephesians says this, uh, take off that worn out and stained outfit of your past life with its selfish desires and worthless ways of thinking. It no longer represents who you are. You are now true human beings with a new way of seeing and thinking. Put on the regalia of your new life, for you have been made new, created again to look like the one who made you, standing in a good way and walking a true and sacred path. One more. Uh, I love this. Uh, I, love, I love that, by the way. Oh, you good? Good. Uh, that's that's wonderful, boy. That is well, so really, rich. Yeah, it really. Re a lot of native people said this really relates. I relate to the idea of this putting the regalia on that represents who I am and the regalia of Christ, the regalia of the chosen one. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing his regalia. I'm representing him as I dance my prayers and and everything i love in luke chapter 11 jesus talks about remember knock and keep on knocking all this uh well, here's how we uh translate 11 9 through 10 it says keep dancing your prayers and the way will open before you search for the ancient pathways and you will find them keep sending up your prayers and they will be heard answers will come to the ones who ask good things will be found by the ones who search for them and the way will open before the ones who keep dancing their prayers and again we use a lot of different wording here uh, but it's wording that conveys this idea in a in a very picturesque way uh, in a very in a sense a very powwow culture way uh, and sometimes we used elements from modern powwows in this translation to convey some of the uh, meanings of words and you know like where paul talks about um you know he hasn't arrived yet um but he keeps uh, we call jesus the head man dancer hmm. he's leading the way you know and and we use different terminology uh that our native people will relate to and then Non-native people think, wow, that sounds, they tell us, that sounds cool, but what does it mean? <laughs> and then we get to share our, a little bit of our culture and stuff. But there's a couple samples. I, you know, if you have a special one, I could probably look it up or something. But uh, uh, we're, we're trying to convey it in a way that's, that's meaningful, that's relevant to our people, that's not... Uh, it's not dumbed dumbed down in any sense of the word um it, it's it's uh it's done with dignity uh and with the sense that they that we are dealing with spiritual things here if you ever read um uh the book um there's a, a book they, they just made a, by a lakota man they just made a movie about it uh something about dogs oh I can't think of the title, but anyway, he says in there because people kept saying, someone was interviewing and saying, "Why, well, why aren't you doing that Indian talk?" And he says, "Well, what, what do you mean? Well, you know the, the way you Indians talk." And he then he kind of goes off and says, "You know, well, hey, you know, we're just, uh, you know, you're just kind of putting that on us and everything, and we don't use talk like that um, every day." And then later on, you find out when he starts storytelling, he goes into his Indian talk. You know, he starts talking like in the way you'd hear the First Nation version. And then the interviewer said, but I thought you didn't talk like that. And he said, oh, we don't on everyday stuff. But when we talk about spiritual things, then we <laughs> use this language. And I thought, perfect, perfect, because that's what we use to uh, that that sense of this is a spiritual sacred story that we're telling and so it, it deserves this kind of um, of wording and storytelling feel terry i wonder if we could just transition to briefly talk about uh the other work that you've contributed to uh called a just passion which is a collection of lenten devotional readings there it is 
yeah, I was so surprised one day I, I opened up my, um, I, I, every so often I'll, I'll check online on InterVarsity Press and check my page to make sure everything's, because they keep adding stuff to my page, maybe a video or something. And I, I looked and I thought, oh my gosh, they made a mistake. They put another book in there. <laughs> my name's on it. Wow, what's this? So I had to, I had to call Ivy Press up and ask them what was up. And then they, they apologized for not telling me <laughs> that they actually uh, used excerpts from the First Nation version in here. So I didn't, I didn't directly thinking put this in here. These portions were chosen by the editors of the book from all their InterVarsity Press authors. I don't even know if they told all the other authors. Who knows? It just showed up one day. And so now I've got another book that my name's on. But I'm so blessed to, that my name and the First Nation version, not so much my name, but the First Nation version actually uh, made it into this uh, amazing Lenten journey and story where the ideas of, uh, you know, justice, um, I think about Jesus said to seek first creator's justice, his righteousness. Uh, and and uh, that, that that's, what it, that's what the good road, that's what we call the kingdom, the good road is all about, uh, is, is, uh, is making things right again, correcting wrongs, identifying where things are out of balance, and how can we bring them back into balance again? How can we take chaos and bring harmony about? And that's part of what we're called to do as followers of Creator Sets Free, Jesus, uh, the, uh, the chosen one, that's what we call Christ, is to be that kind of uh, person that, that, that walks this path of making wrongs right again, this path of justice. And so... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm blessed to be part of this. And, you know, uh, I haven't read it yet because I'm saving it for Lent, you know, so I'm going to I'm going to journey through with all the people who will get this book and 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 uh, journey through it together with them. Uh, it would be it would be fun to have a have a a webinar to go through it together with people that, mm -hmm. that would be. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. But if you guys want, anyone wants to do that, you just go for it. Well, maybe we should try to figure webinar. out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, we need, we're going to take a break and, and just let people know how they can actually get both of those books. I've already put some information in the chat with links to the InterVarsity Press website. And uh, I just want to highlight those books for us. Uh, Uh, the First Nations version, which is the uh, indigenous translation of the New Testament that we've been talking about, uh, is available. I just loved, I just finished reading it yesterday. I was so taken the first day I was reading with the passage on uh, where, where Jesus talks about blessed are those who mourn. And, it, and this version translates it something like uh, creator blesses those who walk the trail of tears. And I, I just realized the allusion to an experience that uh, is uh, engraved in the hearts of so many First Nations people. Uh, one friend of mine said, uh, one person I talked to said that everybody in the First Nations has walked a trail of tears. And uh, it was just a powerful uh, uh, expression that just stopped me in my, uh, stopped me in my tracks as I was reading. The other book uh, that Terry has just talked about is A Just Passion, uh, which is a collection of uh, six, uh, six weeks of readings from various InterVarsity Press authors. I, it's, a, it's a wonderful sampler of uh, the people who are writing with InterVarsity Press, but also uh, it includes a weekly uh, reading from the First Nations version. Uh, and uh, it is just a wonderful uh, uh, resource as we as we enter the Lenten season, uh, put, bringing together our our pursuit, you know, the 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 passion of Jesus and our pursuit of justice. It brings those two things together just wonderfully in this collection of readings, um, 
And uh, so both of those are available and you can uh, find information in the chat about how to purchase them. So with that, we're gonna go, we're gonna shift to some audience uh, question and answer. Uh, so if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna mention uh, uh, Brenda, uh, who actually is a, a colleague of Dan Hawk's comments. Uh, there's a lot of theologizing involved in deciding how to translate those 180 question mark words. One of the reasons I like the First Nations New Testament is uh, that I find the theological vision compelling and very compatible with that of my own brethren tr tradition. Brenda and I are also part of the same congregation, so uh, maybe that's why part of why I liked it so much as well. Uh, Terry, I don't know if you have any comments to that, but that was, uh, uh, I, I, I say amen to Brenda on that. Amen. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would love to hear more. I, I, I do best with questions. Okay, well, um, while, while folks are getting things in there, uh, in, into the chat, one of the things I wanted to talk with you about, uh, one of the questions we didn't get to yet, that I'd sent you was um, one of the distinctive features of this is that you translate the meaning of Hebrew names of people and places into English. Jesus, for example, is creator sets free. Uh, would you explain how you made this translation choice? Why, why you do that? Uh, and you do that throughout uh, the whole translation. Well, I interestingly enough, from the very beginning, when I sat with the uh, the men and women on the Hopi Res, and we began to just reword scriptures, we had to come up with, well, you know, we said, God isn't a normal word we'd use when referring to the divine being. What do Native people use? Oh, we use great spirit. We use creator. And then, you know, as, I, as we go, it extends out. Uh, maker of life, giver of breath. And so, and so from that beginning, we began to realize that every, and I knew from studying Hebrew and from Paul's theology that names have meaning. And that sometimes the meanings of the names give insight to the story being told in the Bible, in the New Testament, or in the Old Testament. The very meanings of names, and Paul theologizes in Romans, and he talks about Abraham and the meaning of his name and how that he is the father of many nations. And, and so Paul actually uses the meaning of Abraham's name for his theological position that he takes. And um, so, so since our native cultures, traditionally, all of our names had meaning. And uh, of course, you know, uh, sometimes we have more than one name, and that's true. Biblically, Abram went to Abraham. Paul or Saul became in the New Testament. Uh, Saul became Paul. There's other uh, other examples of different names being used. Many times in the Psalms, uh, when the the psalmist is speaking, sometimes he uses the name Israel to refer to all the tribes. Okay, the, the, uh, then other times he'll say Jacob. And all Jacob and Israel are the same person. Mm. But they had a name change. And the name change itself is there's a story behind why the name was changed. Now, if you ever watched Dances with Wolves, you'll understand how they named Kevin Costner because he was playing he was playing with that wolf and that wolf was going back and forth and he was trying to grab something and they and they and they looked in and they said oh he's dancing with wolves <laughs> <laughs> in other words that became his name because that's how they saw him he's the one who dances with wolves and so um in our in our native culture sometimes our our we get a, a, several names from different clans that were part of our our, our family tree, a uh, part of our, our totem and different things. So biblically, it's the same way. So 
what we did is uh, what I began to do, and and we and the translation council adopted it. Matter of fact, at first I didn't do the names of places, but the translation council said, "Let's do the names of places too." So of course, Jerusalem becomes the village of peace. Village of peace, because that's what Jerusalem means, and. Uh, there's many other names. Uh, Peter stands on the rock. And the most important name of all, Jesus. Oh boy, did we, did that name, I mean, I came up with an early version of it before the translation council came and I was hoping they would approve it because, because it helped keep it consistent from the other stuff I had written. But um, we talked a lot. Some, some of us wanted to name him uh, creator with us. That would be a good name because there's the prophecy, Emmanuel, creator with us. But, but the, actually the angel said the way that that prophecy of creator with us came to pass was by giving him the name Yeshua. And the name Yeshua, because he will, what does it say? Save his people from their sins. He, so we said, uh, Yeshua is Yah, the short version of Yahweh, and Shua, or I, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I'm not a, actually, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I'm working at it, uh, um, a little, uh, a little one. But um, it means to to set free, to deliver, to make whole. There's so much depth to the meaning of His name, but we chose Creator sets free, Creator to replace Yah, and sets free as the meaning of to deliverance. And so, so the, the verse says, they gave him the name creator sets free because he would set his people free from their bad hearts and their wrongdoings, and, or their bad hearts and broken ways, depending on uh, how we translated the word for sin uh, in, 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 uh, in there. And there's reasons that we used uh, the name is now, I'll, I'll say this, that was the best decision we made. That was the best decision we made. We have gotten more wonderful feedback from our native people who are reading this scripture. They said they read through the genealogy. Some people have written to me and said, I just opened Matthew and I started reading. When I got opened the genealogy, I just began to weep as I read the names, the meanings of the names, because it's so connected to our native way of doing things. And I thought, oh, this, this story already, just by reading meanings to names, means so much more to me now. It's, it's going deeper uh, in me. And so we, we get that feedback so much. That's the number one thing, positive feedback we get, is the translate the meanings of all the names. Well, I wonder if we could, uh, you know, on that, uh, Alice asks, asks a question as well about the response that you've received. What kinds of responses are you getting from uh, uh, First Nations people as well as, has there been anything critical? And what kind of response have you seen from non-Native people? Well, um, you know, sometimes you, you, you try to put a positive spin on feedback right sure but we don't have to, i'm going to tell you something i don't have to give a positive spin there is so much positive feedback that I, that I, I i'm starting to question come on somebody challenge me a little better you know make me answer for something here because if you go on amazon.com and look up this book you'll see that there's over 500 five star ratings and I thought and then there's like four ne negative ones out of all of those you know and I couldn't believe it so the response and on Amazon the response I read them there I like to go see what people are thinking of this and and uh and on Facebook and different places the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive from our native people and from non-native people uh our native one one uh, native student in a college, uh, a Christian college in 
uh, in Canada wrote me recently. I was the First Nation version was her assignment. She was supposed to read a book and then reach out to the author and give the author feedback on what they thought about the book, negative or positive. And uh, as part of this whole as, as a, her school assignment. And so next thing you know, I'm getting this email. She says, I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to read it. And, and then she gave me her feedback uh, a few weeks later. And she said one of the things she said was when I sat down, I was very suspicious of this book. I, I looked at it critically, she said. I didn't think there was any way you, that you could really speak to our, you know, have the scriptures really speak to our native people in a native way. She says, but the more I read it, the more I realized, oh my gosh, this is opening me in new ways. This is affecting me. And it was interesting because her family is not, are not believers, she told me. And she's always wanted to sit, she's a believer, and she's always wanted and asked her parents, would you sit down and read the Bible with me? And they would say, no, no. Well, when she took this Bible to them and told them, this is a, a Bible done by Native people and for Native people, they said, okay, we'll let, we'll let you read some of this. And they started reading it together, and they liked it, and now they read regularly together as a family. They are reading the scriptures and we've gotten many feedbacks like this. We've actually uh, uh, gotten stories uh, from native people. There's a, a native pastor. His name is Bruce Plummer from Montana Indian Min Ministries in, uh, in Montana uh, on the Fort Belknap reservation. And he's done ministry for years uh, and years. He has the, the uh, respect of his people. Well, he found a copy of this, and he's under a Southern Baptist ministry. And he found a copy of this and loved it, but wasn't so sure it was a good one. So he gave it to his Greek scholar in the Southern Baptist that he knew and said, is this okay? And that scholar wrote back and said, they did a great job. It's okay. You can use this one. <laughs> and so he now, he he's made it part of his mission. He's told me this, and he's praying for 50,000 copies. That it, and, and so he's, I think he's gotten up to 8,000 so far that he's distributed onto reservations and different places. I heard that a, ch a church working with the tribe, uh, the Ute tribe, has distributed one to every family on the, tr on, on the uh, mm -hmm. Southern Ute tribe. Um, I'm getting all kinds of feedback like this, uh, that it's being used, it's being accepted, it's being brought into churches. Not everybody loves it. And sometimes uh, it's kind of interesting because, because the native people who have been assimilated most into our Western culture, they're the ones that question it the most. Hmm. But it's the ones that are, are more you know, connected to their culture and tradition that realize that this really has, that the scripture has power when it's related in the right way to the people. And so uh, non-native people, uh, one, one seminary professor, I won't tell you his name, interviewed me and he said, Terry, I wanna tell you something. You have, this version has revitalized my love for the Bible. He says, I was getting bored. I spend so much time with the scriptures going over and over, reading the same scriptures the same way in devotionals. And, and, and he says, suddenly it came alive to me again. Suddenly it made me think in different ways than I, than even I as a college professor, theologian have thought before. You're opening up new avenues with this. And I'm thinking, wow, our native culture, our native way of seeing and speaking has power even beyond our own culture. And that's what I love about it, uh, is that it's actually impacting culture, not only uh, the uh, colonial or the, the, the uh, it's, it, I won't say that, the, the uh, dominant culture the, uh, out here, uh, but it's being used in Brazil now. They're actually translating 
on the on the spot during Bible studies within the indigenous people in Brazil. They're translating it into uh, from English into uh, the Brazilian language. Um, help me, Portuguese, Portuguese, yep, <laughs> Portuguese. Yep. and then there's Portuguese speakers who know the indigenous languages and translate it into the indigenous language. And, and they love it more than when they translate like another translation, they, to hear it m more in an indigenous way. We got a note from a, a man who's working with an indigenous tribe in Iraq. And he brought the First Nation version to them and they're actually translating it into this tribal language and they like it. They're opening up it's opening new doors for them there. Uh, in Mexico, an SIL Wycliffe tr uh, person who trains the translators did a whole article in the in the SIL journal uh, for translators on the First Nation version and how it how that we need to begin to decolonize our translations yeah. in all these cultures. And and so I I never in, thought it would ever have this kind of impact, but. Uh, even in India, we've had translators contact us wanting to know more, using it as a precedent for other translations. So, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's it's almost scaring me. Well, Terry, I, I think we're coming about to our end of our time, and I apologize for those who have not been able to uh, we have, have time to discuss the questions that you put in the chat. Thank you. For the there were some great questions there. Uh, I'll just I'll just read them so that at least uh, and if and if you want to stick around for a few minutes after the call after the recording ends, uh, we may be able to talk a little bit about those. Uh, Brenda came back with a theological question about what difference it makes to think of salvation in terms of Good harmony question. and reconciliation, and making things right rather than a crime and punishment model based on Roman Western European law. Um, Paul wondered about the uh, uh, stories of how the, your council worked through differences. Um, Lisa uh, talked about how you put parentheses uh, by the name, so the name of Jesus and others, so that we could make those connections, which is really helpful for those of us who are acquainted with the traditional renderings. Uh, and uh, uh, Lisa also commented about your uh, discussion of the controversial verses on women, marriage, and leadership, and the sense oh, of honor that you questions. conveyed in the translation. Uh, and we should do another one of these just to answer some of these questions. I know and, these are just these are great, great questions. Uh, but uh, I do want to also honor your time and our guests and, and the rest of the people on the call. So one more time, we're going to let you know about how to uh, pick up a copy of Terry's book. Uh, and also, uh, I'll have information in the chat uh, about our next conversation. Maybe we should schedule another conversation, Terry. This, is, this has been so much fun. And I, I want to just say, I do value what you have done in terms of not only how this speaks to our First Nations peoples, but how this speaks to the rest of us. Uh, and uh, I, what, what I think... Uh, some of your comments and our discussion have, have revealed is that this is a version that is enriching for the whole church, that God has given First Nations people things that are gifts to the rest of us as well that we can receive. And I want to thank you and, and express my own gratitude to you for that. And with that, I'm also going to do uh, a commercial here. <laughs> Again, um, we've been talking about two books today. One is uh, Just Passion, uh, which is available for 40% off, uh, a series of Lenten devotional readings. And I, I had a chance to work through this, and it's just a marvelous uh, mm -hmm. gift of readings from different uh, InterVarsity Press authors. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton, Sheila R Wise Rowe, Tish Harrison Warren. There's one by Eugene Peterson in there. Uh, and a number of others. It's just so rich. Uh, whoops, I've advanced to our next slide. Let me go back one here. Uh, and of course, we've been talking a lot about the First Nations version. And if you haven't already picked up a copy, I hope you'll uh, pick up a copy at InterVarsity Press. Uh, 
there. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And and one of my dreams, Terry, you met, I think we mentioned that there are 6 million uh, First Nations people in North America. I'd love to see one day that every one of them had a copy of this. Um, you know, that would, that what a, what a joy that would be. Our next conversation uh, is with uh, uh, Kyle Mayard Schapp uh, on a book that uh, he's uh, coming out with called Following Jesus in a Warming World. Many of us are concerned about what's happening with our climate uh, and how we care for uh, the creation. Uh, Kyle's the vice president of the Evangelical Environmental Network, and he's going to be talking about sharing stories from the field theological and scriptural exploration and practical advice. Uh, I think for many of us, one of the real questions is, is there hope in terms of what's happening in uh, our world? And Kyle believes there is and offers uh, ways that we can turn sort of this paralysis of analysis into meaningful action. And so um, there is information in the chat about how you can sign up for the next conversation, which will be on March 9th, uh, noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. So please come and join us. Uh, finally, uh, we just want to thank everybody who has been here today. Uh, first of all, I, I just again thank Terry for your time here. Uh, we thank all of you who have joined us. We'd like to thank InterVarsity Press for its uh, assistance Absolutely. in creating these conversations and for the great discounts on books and all the rest. Uh, we, uh, the conversation is brought to you by the Emerging Scholars Network. And uh, we would love if you've not joined us uh, that you might do so at blog.emergingscholars.org. That will uh, sign you up for a monthly newsletter that lets you know about these conversations and other kinds of uh, conversations and events and resources that the Emerging Scholars Network is developing. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ESNIVCF and visit our YouTube channel, uh, uh, which is also youtube.com slash ESNIVCF. So with that, uh, we're gonna conclude our recording and thank everybody and uh, especially Terry, and uh, if anybody would love to stick around to talk a little bit more, you're welcome to do so for at least a few minutes, and then we'll let 